Welcome to the Crypto Women panel. Thanks for coming. Um, for the next 20 minutes, it's going to be all tampons, periods, mood swings. So guys, leave the room now. This is your warning. Um, yeah. But in all seriousness, this is going to be the panel for discussing women's issues. Um, so if you've ever want, asked the question of why so few women show up to these things, um, how can we create or how can we draw more women into this space and create opportunities for them as um, founders or consumers of for customers of your business, investors, or participation in um, any scale. That's what we'll be discussing today. So we've got a really awesome panel here with us. Um, my name is Esther Tung. I'm from Vancouver with the Simon Fraser Bitcoin Club. We are the world's first university-run student club. Um, so we are about on the verge of getting our university to take Bitcoins for our campus bookstore. Um, Today, we were supposed to have the Bitcoin wife here, so she's not here today, but Marnie Melrose has taken her place. Um, would you like to start with the introductions? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm a, a Bitcoin technology evangelist, and I've been in this world for a very short period of time, but I've actually been a technology evangelist for the last 12 years. And, you know, being in the computers, for 30 years, when I really understood what Bitcoin was all about and the impact that it could have for the unbanked 6 billion people, there's 7, people, 7 billion people in the world right now, and 6 billion of us don't have access to economic power. And a lot of those are women. A lot of the women in developing countries aren't even allowed to have banks. So I'm really excited about it. Um, so I'm Catherine Nicholson. I'm founder of a startup called BlockCypher, which is a platform as a service for coins. We run and maintain the software on the back end so middleware and application developers can focus on their business. My background is I graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in Stanford. Um, I built very large scale software systems in energy management, CRM, educational um, uh, software companies, and I'm the mother of two kids. I got into Bitcoin because my co-founder and I were building an educational app, a mobile web app, and we ran into an absolute wall in processing payments because school systems run entirely on checks and cash. And so that's what led us into the digital currency world. Hi, I'm Stephanie Murphy. I am the host of a podcast called Let's Talk Bitcoin, and many people here may know me from that podcast, but I also do a lot of other things. Um, I'm a voiceover artist. I have my own business where I do voiceovers, and I do a lot of my business in Bitcoin. I've been in the Bitcoin world since 2011, which was pretty early. I found out about Bitcoin from Free Talk Live, which is another radio show that I'm involved with hosting, and I couldn't be more excited about the potential for Bitcoin to um, bring freedom to people all over the world, men and women, but of course it has some special applications uh, for women who really need it. And as Marnie said, there are so many people around the world who are just who are living in poverty and who could really benefit from stuff like micro-lending with Bitcoin and with b having the power to really have more control over their own finances. And, uh, you know, this is sort of part of, it's, it's kind of related to work that I do with a Bitcoin charity, 100% uh, Bitcoin Coin charity called Free Aid, and that's F R three three A I D. It's pronounced free, but spelled F R three three. And uh, one of the things we do is uh, disaster relief worldwide, and. Uh, education about health, wellness, and safety, as well as volunteer first aid. So I have a lot of interest in um, humanitarian kind of stuff, but also in entrepreneurship, and I think those are kind of the two ways that Bitcoin can really have the potential to set a lot of people free worldwide. Uh, my name is Tatiana Moroz. I'm a singer-songwriter. Um, I recently wrote a Bitcoin song. Um, before that, you know, I've been singing since I was a little kid. But something that's always appealed to me is is the ability to use music to change the world and to um, help bring about social change and prevent war and, and or at least raise awareness for war and put some pressure on the overlords. Um, and when I found out about Bitcoin at first, I didn't really understand it. But in recent months, I've gotten, you know, all of a sudden the tipping point happened and I totally get it 
well, sort of. And, um, and it inspired me to write the Bitcoin jingle, which really turned into a song because I think that what we're dealing with here is, a, is an incredible way to withdraw support for the state, to withdraw support for war, and to create a whole other world without having to stand there with a protest sign and beg for change. I think we can just do it by, uh, by participating in Bitcoin. So that's why it's exciting for me. So our room here today is pretty gender equal, but that doesn't reflect the conference as a whole. I think I saw maybe all of less than 30 women out of a few hundred attendees. Um, and this lack of women in Bitcoin, this problem is sort of underlied by a lack of women in tech and finance, which Bitcoin has a leg in both worlds. Um, and that's, so why, why does this happen? Um, Catherine, would you like to speak to that? Okay, so I actually think the lack of women in um, tech and Bitcoin is endemic of, uh, of a problem that we have much earlier on, and that's girls in tech. Um, I'm a huge advocate for STEM, especially for girls. STEM is science, technology, engineering, math. In the U.S., we have a crisis. Only 12% of engineers are, girl, are women. Um, in the decade between 2000 and 2011, there was a 79% decline in women in college expressing interest in studying engineering and computer science. And yet, by 2020, that's only six years from now, there will be 1.4 million jobs that are computer related. So if you are, if you are a parent and you're thinking oh, job security for, for my kids, that's probably one of the best things that you can do to encourage your children to at least express some sort of interest in. However, only 10% of girls say that their parents even talk to them about becoming a computer science or engineer. So to me, that's, it's, it's a pipeline problem in, in moving um, girls into finance and tech because now we're noticing the problem that there are no women in tech. That, that's beginning to change as well. Yes, so there are some bright spots. Um, UC Berkeley has exactly. a huge number of freshmen right now that are in their uh, beginning computer science classes, certainly. We see a lot of uh, little bright spots in the horizon. Um, last, uh, at the beginning of December, I went to organize the Hour of Code, which was trying to get 10 million um, uh, students to, to code for that one week during Computer Science Week in commemoration of Grace Hopper, who was a pioneering woman in computer science. And um, I lobbied the school and the teachers uh, in the district and heard nothing. And so I decided to run it into uh, in my house, basically. I could only accommodate about 15 students, and I had 70 people sign up. And so that was a huge force in which I went back to the district and said, please open one of your libraries. And they kind of stood up and said, oh, wow, there is an interest there. So, yes, I do think that there is, there is change afoot. Absolutely. In the, she was referring to the, the Berkeley for the first time ever in their introductory to computer science, women actually outnumbered men. So that is definitely a bright spot. And, and I totally agree with the fact that, um, you know, we need to not, we have these little girls or we have these little boys, and, and it's kind of our fault. We direct them into a path that is appropriate for a little boy or a little girl. And I actually came into tech. I was a, a model when I was 11 years old. And I had been invited to New York to compete for a, um, a contract. And I went to a Radio Shack store. I picked up a book. And I looked at it. And I would not leave that store until my grandmother brought that book. And she said, why? And I said, because, Grandma, when I grow up, I'm going to be in computers. You know, now it's uh, a few years later. <laughs> and I, I've been in computers all my life. And I did a complete about face. They had, you know, flights booked and everything. But I was like, no, I don't like the way that people look at me or the way that people treat me. Because I'm smarter than most of these people, right? That's, that's what's going on inside my head. And it uh, turns out, I have a pretty high IQ, so, you know. But my family backed me on that, and they didn't push me to continue down the path that I had started. So I think it, it really, it's, it's up to us to make those changes. There's, sort of, there's another issue in here. 
it's one issue to talk about uh, women and girls in STEM fields and being founders and leaders in the Bitcoin community and starting Bitcoin companies. That's one thing. But when we're talking about just people who use Bitcoin, that's almost a separate issue. I mean, it it's, it's not academia. You don't have to be a, a founder or anything to have a Bitcoin wallet on your smartphone and to buy stuff with Bitcoin. So how do we get those people a little more towards uh, a balanced gender demographic? And to... From my own experience, I love to talk to people about Bitcoin. Uh, I love to meet people who know what Bitcoin is at all and answer their questions. And I love to help them set up smartphone wallets and give them a little bit of their first Bitcoin. And I do this with men, but especially women. And in my experience, you know, women take to it just as well as men do. They understand it. They're interested in it. They like it. They ask questions, especially when they feel comfortable asking questions like as a newbie because they, they don't think they're going to be laughed at or anything. And there's, not a pro there's nothing about women that uh, makes it so they can't understand Bitcoin or they're not interested in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin itself doesn't care who you are. It's, it's neutral with respect to the users. Uh, and so it should be gender neutral, too. So there's nothing about Bitcoin that is anti-women. And I, I think, really, if we just take a little more active role in reaching out to all of our female friends and all of our male friends, but especially females, if we want to see more of them, they will get it and they will use Bitcoin. Absolutely. And to add to that, you know, women are very powerful in the home. You know, most of the time they control the purse strings in the home. And so, you know, if you get them using it, they're also going to influence their children in saying, oh, well, this is how you do this. Because one of the first things I did was I set my 12-year-old son up with a wallet and he, his allowance goes into Bitcoin. Because you know, that could fund his university. I have no faith in fiat currency to fund his university. I think you bring up a, a great point, Marnie, because I think th there is also the women as consumers. And I think for women, we do control a huge amount of um, financial power. But we also need to look at, for Bitcoin, is enabling the use cases that typical women have and their spending patterns as well. Um, I'm the mother of two very young kids. I know where I spend my money, and that's in food and clothes, because every time I turn around, it seems like uh, my kids are outgrowing their clothes. And so certainly, if, if we want to proliferate the usage of Bitcoin as a currency, it's got to be adapted to what are the use cases that most women are more likely to use Bitcoin for. We don't all shop for sheets online. True. Um, well. I guess, are we going back to the tech question, or now are we talking about women's shopping habits? I, I think that, um, you know, for me, I am not a tech person at all. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, maybe we were all talking on Twitter about, you know, did you grow up in a tech thing? I did feel that there was some sort, certain things that were boy stuff, and then there was certain things that were girl stuff. And then as I got older, I worked in a recording studio, and I would fight it, and I would fight it. But I think once I allowed myself to acknowledge that I could understand some of this, and it wasn't so mystical that I was able to catch on. So... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's just sort of a mindset thing and enabling your daughters to uh, not get bullied out by the boys and not make it into a boys club is important. And, and the usability of Bitcoin in terms of explaining it to people like myself who don't consider themselves techie, like I wanted to know the first thing was what can I buy with it? You know, and, and giving those case studies and, and showing people examples, I think, is a great way to get a lot of different types of folks involved. Yeah. Um, and I also think from a developer perspective, and we heard Andreas, if anybody attended his session, he's a great speaker and a great Absolutely. proponent, advocate for Bitcoin. Um, but it, it, it's... It, I see Bitcoin, um, the underlying technology behind Bitcoin, as the currency is just the first application of it, just like email was for the internet. And if you think about microblogging and social sites, there, there's a huge amount of, of applications that can develop that are not just currency-based. However, I do think that to draw not only more women in the development community, but also men as well, that there has to be some sort of ease of transition. Um, and if any of you have run the Bitcoin daemon, it's, it, it is a 
it, it's a it's a capital B, um, and so I do think that there's an opportunity, particularly in in the development world, to specialize in certain areas to make it easier for other people to join in the development, to utilize the technology, and to build the applications that are going to solve just not only everyday but world problems. Do you have any ideas for that? Um, because all four of you have spoken to um, how, you know, as little girls, we're all socialized to stay away from tech. But I mean, Bitcoin is happening at such an accelerated pace that by the time we teach our children to get into tech and get into Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin will be 20 years ahead of schedule. So if you're, you know, like a grown woman, if you're maybe just starting out to go to college or you've even just graduated in uh, from an English major, how could we integrate women more into tech right out of college? Can, can I answer? Yes, of course. Okay, great. Um, Phil Mannix just uh, interviewed me today. If you go on uh, Twitter, I'm MidasMarney.com and the article's there. And um, I love what they're doing. And uh, they're, Phil Mannix is like a YouTube for really high quality videos. And they're, the model of getting the word out there is they actually pay people to do social media. And they pay them in Bitcoin starting February 1st. And what they do with that money, there's a there's a annex, uh, a women's foundation on the side of it. And they actually put that back into training the women how to do social media in developing countries so that they can, you know, now start promoting and, and using Bitcoin and being able to have bank accounts. And so, you know, teaching people just how to use Bitcoin by, you know, paying them in Bitcoin is, is a huge way. It's a huge way. It's absolutely massive. And, and I think also there's going to be a rapid proliferation. I mean, every time I turn around, there are more startups that are within this ecosystem. There's going to be a, a massive proliferation of, of tools that make it simpler, of specialization. I and mean, that's, that's the reason why we have started this company, because it is the wild, wild west. There's a lot of opportunity. And if you think about it, so my daughter's a fourth grader, and we're studying the pioneering days, and it's very familiar. Um, if you think of the analogy of the canvas covered wagon, well, every pioneer had to go cut down a tree and make a wheel and then worry about keeping the wheel on the wagon before they could think about building a better wagon or a faster wagon. There are just tons of startups right now, myself included, that are looking at building a better wheel, that are looking at building a better canvas. And so I think by the time th this, 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 it, we're seeing an explosion, as I said, of startups. I think by the time our daughters are, are uh, coming out of college, it's going to be very, very easy to just build applications right on top of it. Not only, so they can not only be consumers, but they can, be, um, they can drive the development of the technology as well. Yeah, I think there's also a level, um, there's, there's something in between a Bitcoin consumer and a founder of a Bitcoin startup or tech company, there's the mom who blogs and wants to get tips in Bitcoin. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And like anyone can do that. And it's a lot less intimidating than starting a company, for instance. And so wh when I first learned about Bitcoin, my, my first thought wasn't actually what can I buy with this, but how can... I get paid in this. <laughs> exactly. Paying people. I think that's key. So I, I started thinking of like kind of little business ideas. And at the same time in my life, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning of the panel, but I am actually, I have a PhD in biochemistry. I'm a former research scientist. And I stopped working in science because I basically wasn't happy with the lifestyle. And I wanted to do something else. And so now I focus on Bitcoin and have my voiceover business. But I, I was really interested uh, at the time when I was really catching fire with Bitcoin of, you know, how can I work for myself and how can I have a lifestyle that enables me to have more freedom of what I do with my time and more financial freedom of what I can do with my own money that I earn. And Bitcoin seemed like a wonderful solution to that. Um, and so I think it's a big selling point, especially for mothers who are looking at uh, jobs where they can spend more time with their kids, you know, maybe passive income streams so they don't have to go to a job, a nine to five, if that's not something they want to do. Um, now they have the option to do that and to use Bitcoin Bitcoin to help enable them as a tool to have more personal freedom in their lives. Um, so I think that's just a huge selling point. And, you know, it takes all, all types. You know, some women want 
to be moms. Some women don't want to be moms. Some women want to have nine to five. Some women don't. Um, and we can really appeal to all of them <laughs> with Bitcoin. That's the great thing about it. So fine. Oh, go ahead. Well, um, so we're all talking about bringing women into the tech angle. I think that, um, you know, I, I think that women can bring other things to it. Like we don't necessarily have to be put into the tech aspect of it in order to be valuable. Like I think that the way that women communicate with other women and the way that women communicate with people is totally different than the, the nerdy people that are behind, not, no offense to the nerds, but <laughs> um, <laughs> that are behind the protocol, you know? And, and I think that it takes all kinds. It's, it's a community that we're trying to build here, not just um, a protocol and, and like the, the tech angle. And, and I think that that should be celebrated, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Completely concur. Um, we're just at time now, so questions. Um, I think how we do this is we have, oh, she, Patty's got a mic at the front, so just line up by her. Thanks, Marty, for filling in for Pua, who are really sad, can't be here today. Uh, she was really instrumental in something that was really exciting that took place with um, women. And it was Ala Kalani, the uh, Botswana Bitcoin lady. Um, and she tweeted something that she had read on Motherboard that was an article that was done uh, interviewing this woman in Botswana, Africa. And within like 15 minutes of that tweet, I had the author's address, which I never would have been able to get except through the internet. I mean, you know, that I would have had to, you know, snail mail, whatever. I mean, it just happened like that. And then sent her some Bitcoin. She had, like, received four Bitcoin within a couple days. It was life-changing for her. Now, that's all a really fun, exciting story. And people go, wow. What they don't understand is if I'd sent her $184 in cash, she would have had to walk 20 miles. She probably would have been raped on the way there. And then if she left, she would have been left with like 80 bucks out of the 184 and the rest would have gone to the state and to the people that are, you know, taking that money uh, for the service. And then she would have been robbed on the way home. So this is not, I mean, you know, we talk about what we can buy and education in the United States, but it, what's, it's going to revolutionize uh, life for the 70% of women in India that don't have access to feminine hygiene products, you know? And so there's so much social change that can be done. So I wanted to ask you, Stephanie, whom I've known for a, while, a long time, in considering and, um, kind of what you've seen through the conferences and through Let's Talk Bitcoin in terms of like social change, just addressing things that we take for granted here in the United States. We're all talking about college education. These women can't get tampons. <laughs> Right, yeah, and that's really important uh, to think about. Sometimes it's really easy to get um, in a bubble, you know, when we're in the U.S. and we're going to these nice hotels and Bitcoin conferences, it's so easy to think about, well, you know, our first world problems, basically. <laughs> um, the thing that I, the area where I see a lot of potential for people in the developing world is ways to use Bitcoin that work on so-called dumb phones, you know, that work by SMS messaging. Um, in, you know, Kenya, for instance, there's a lot of uh, commerce that gets done through mobile phones, and those are not smartphones, they're just SMS enabled. And so technologies like 37 Coins and like Coinapult and like uh, Coin to SMS, there's a bunch of them, uh, but ways to send Bitcoins through mobile phones are um, are very helpful for those. One area where I think there's a lot of opportunity but not a lot of action yet, and I hope there will be action, is in microfinance. Um, because microfinance, uh, if, if you're not familiar, it's, it's like a Nobel Prize winning uh, type of uh, innovation where people in the developing world who don't have access to credit, banking, loans, can get, um, can get those services um, from small lenders in the developed world and capital can kind of flow to them. And this is services like Kiva and Zadisha and um, the Grameen Bank, which was the first microlending institution. Um, if Kiva started accepting Bitcoins, that would be huge. I, I don't know how they send the money, you know, from the U.S. or Europe to India or to Peru or to wherever, uh, but they've got to do it somehow, and they're probably using 
Western Union. Mm -hmm. There are 69 countries in the world that are not served by PayPal, so you can't even send a PayPal payment there. Uh, and if you send money by Western Union, like you said, Michelle, they're going to take 20% of it at least, you know, to try to get that to the person. Plus, they may have some hazards or risks when they're trying to pick up the money and walking around with cash. Um, so there are some real problems that Bitcoin can overcome. Um, and I think that the easiest way to do it in places where there's not a lot of in internet infrastructure is probably through these mobile phones. So I, I really hope that major companies start to pick up the ball with micro lending and integrating it with Bitcoin and enabling people to lend with Bitcoin. Um, like I said, we, we don't have a lot of ways to lend with Bitcoin yet, but I hope they're coming. If I could just add something to that, because I'm hugely passionate about that as well. If you want to address world poverty, start with a woman. 70% of the world's poor are women. And as Stephanie alluded to, microfinance, it's, it's, a, it's a small loan. It's a $100, $200 loan. It's just chump change for us, but makes a huge difference for women in developing countries. Now, the issue is the digital divide. Right? There's less than 40% of the global population that has access to internet. It's not going to change because it requires, unless the infrastructure costs dramatically decreases, it's, it, it's, it's just too costly to put fiber and infrastructure in place. However, 96% of the global population has access to a mobile phone. So you can change the world one SMS at a time. Now, when you talk about microfinancing, why it's so exciting for Bitcoin, the interest rate on microfinancing is something on the order of 25 to f over 50%. And when you look at the cost of microfinancing, one, there's the cost of money, okay? The second one is default. But the default rate is only about 1%. It averages about 1%. The entirety of the rest of the interest is on transaction cost. Can you even imagine paying a 50% interest rate on the mortgage on your house? That's insane. And so this is what Bitcoin can dramatically change in regards to making fluidity in the microfinancing world. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing is, it's so sad that these fees are highest for the people who actually can't pay it. Can't pay it. You know, it's like we're feeding off of them. And, and Bitcoin really gives them that. And this is the key about Bitcoin. It gives them financial economic power that they've never had in their entire lives, ever. Hey, uh, first, I'd just like to say thank you for coming out. You're a really good panel. Um, so for all of the gentlemen in here, I can pretty well assume that they would love it if there's 100% adoption of women in technology and Bitcoin. Um, for just kind of on a personal level so that we can help individually, what are some tips that you have for just for us to make it easier and help kind of drive the fostering of, or of uh, technology for women? Um, I don't know why that was funny, but I guess it is. Uh, so I, um, I was in this uh, Berlin conference uh, just a few weeks ago with a friend of mine, and, and she had come out of one of the talks, and she came out really pissed because the guys were talking about um, how can we get women into Bitcoin? <laughs> why don't we make shopping coin? Like, crap like that isn't going to win us over. I, I mean, just talking to us like real people and not like little dumb dollies, that would be really nice. We don't just shop. <laughs> we actually preserve capital. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, Tatiana. I mean, women are just people, you know, so you can talk to us like people and not space aliens, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, that's really what I would say, too. Um, Offer to help him set up a wallet. I got my first Bitcoins when a friend of mine, a male friend, um, offered to help me set up a Bitcoin wallet. And uh, another male friend gave me some Bitcoins as a gift. And at the time, you know, they were worth a dollar or something like that. But you can give somebody a dollar worth of Bitcoin. It doesn't cost much to you, probably, as somebody who's already interested in Bitcoin. But they will remember that forever. And they will really appreciate it. And especially, they'll appreciate help in setting up a wallet and practicing using it. So I think that's the best like, nearly free thing you can do um, for anybody who you want to help get excited about Bitcoin. I'd add to that that if you have a company, start accepting Bitcoins. You know, 
If, if, if all of you guys are here and you have companies and you don't accept Bitcoin, shame on you. <laughs> really. <laughs> and if you don't own a company, start with your mom. Exactly. <laughs> My mom loves Bitcoin. <laughs> and if you own a company and you need help accepting Bitcoin, just ask, ask anyone here. Um, they would be probably glad to help. Absolutely. Um, this question might come off as rhetorical, but I am curious to actual solutions to it. And that is, is that, first off, it seems like a lot of the VC capital coming into the Bitcoin space is to create a better shopping experience. Do you think that helps with the adoption of Bitcoin? And also, the v not the VCs, but a lot of the users of Bitcoin seem to find it humorous to spread memes saying, oh, no, my husband died, and it's a picture of a woman. I don't know how to use Bitcoin. I don't know his private key. I don't know what a private key is. Do you think these things help uh, with adoption of Bitcoin uh, with women? Well, when you think of money, right, what's the first thing you think of? Well, you making it, apparently, <laughs> which might be what I should start thinking about. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's an important component of it, you know, um, um, getting people to, to buy. Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things about Bitcoin is that it is so easy to buy stuff. Like, it's just you click send and you bought it. You don't have to enter any credit card information. I, I don't know about you all, but I remember my, my mom and my dad, but especially my mom, was really afraid for a while to buy anything online with a credit card because she was like, well, I, I don't want to put my personal information into this website. How do I know where it's going? And she's totally right to be skeptical of that because there have been a lot of hacks and thefts. So yeah, of course it's a selling point to create a better and more secure shopping experience that you don't have to give up potentially dangerous information. Um, as, I mean, think of a woman who is trying to escape a stalker or an abusive ex-husband or something like that and doesn't want him to know what she's buying online. Maybe she has a chance to do that with more privacy by using Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, there are absolutely absolutely are, is a huge value to creating a better shopping experience. Um, but there's more that's needed as well. You know, it's not the only thing, it's just a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and as far as the, as the memes and the kind of jokes about few women in Bitcoin, um, they can get a little old. I mean, I think the women that are here, we've kind of let those roll off of our backs, right? I mean, I do feel a little annoyed when I see those things. Um, and you know, you can always just not laugh at them and say, uh, that's not funny. Don't, don't post them, right? <laughs> OK, my question is kind of related to that. So all of you probably have gone to other meetups like this one and talked a lot about Bitcoin and dealt with a lot of the Bitcoin community. And I'm wondering if you have ever or often had the experience of feeling unwelcome or someone made some unfavorable assumptions about you, whether your, you know, your understanding of Bitcoin or your abilities in it technical respect and if if that has happened um, how you dealt with it and you know how you got past it I think uh, people are really nice at these conferences and I think that they're really warm and they're really excited about it I feel very bad for the women that have these bad experiences I've read a couple articles online about women that just felt unwelcome and I feel really lucky because everybody's been really cool and and has tried to to extend you know their knowledge to me so uh, I think people here are psyched to be here you know they're really excited about this and they're thinking big picture so it, it breeds positivity which is which is really nice to experience yeah, the majority of experiences, the overwhelming majority of experiences I've had in the Bitcoin world as a woman are positive, totally great and welcoming. And, you know, there have been a few that were less than positive and maybe those stand out to some people or, or maybe if that's your first experience, that's what you're going to remember. And uh, it's, it's hard. I don't know what to do with it. All we can do as individuals, I think, is try not to be part of the problem. And if we see somebody at a Bitcoin conference, that, man or woman, but especially women if you're interested in that, that looks lost or that looks confused, you know, just say hi and ask if they have any questions or they, you can help and that goes a long way. I hate to cut this short, we're running out of time. So um, if any of you women would, or anybody would like to, especially women, take pictures with them right now really quickly and then they can answer any other questions further across the room. And thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause for the crypto woman. Thank you.